Welcome to the people joining us live today and those tuning into the recording afterwards. I'm Helen and I'm um, Deputy Chair of the Parkrun Research Board and I'll be chairing this session today. If you're with us live, we've just got some of the usual housekeeping. If you could please keep your microphones and cameras off whilst the speakers are talking. Please use the chat function for questions and any reflections you've got. And there will be a, a short Q&A after all the speakers have spoken in which you can use your mic to ask a question if you wish to do so. Please do use the chat function, introduce yourself if you want where you are today and even share your um, experience of, of what it's been like without Parkrun for you over um, the, la the last 14 months or so. We're really pleased to welcome you today to the first in a series of seminars hosted by the Parkrun Research Board. The Parkrun Research Board is hosted at the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre at Sheffield Hallam University and it's chaired by Steve Hake, one of our speakers today. The board consists of academics, researchers, practitioners and Parkrun staff and its purpose really is to oversee high quality research activity linked to uh, Parkrun across the world. So anyone that's been following recent updates from Parkrun will know it's been quite a big few weeks. But in today's seminar, we're going to talk about something that hasn't really had that much coverage. We're going to focus on how Parkrunners themselves are feeling about returning to Parkrun and the role that Parkrun could potentially play in the promotion of, of health and well-being. So for our lineup today, we are in for a treat. Um, we've got the Don of all things data insights, Mike Graney, who's head of analysis at Parkrun. We've got Professor Steve Hake, who's chair of the Parkrun Research Board, who's also very much big into his data. And when he's not um, number crunching or writing books, um, he's usually running or cycling around Sheffield. And finally, we have Dr. Rebecca Robinson, a consultant in sport and exercise medicine. And she'll be sharing um, with us what her role involves. And I'll be asking Rebecca for her advice on how to make um, a safe and sensible return to Parkrun. So um, let's um, get things going. First in the hot seat, we've got um, Mike, who will describe the insights he's gathered from Parkrunners during the pandemic. Um, safe to say Mike hasn't had his feet up for the past 14 months, um, but has actually been really quite busy. So over to you, Mike. Excellent, thanks, Helen. Um, I'm hoping that you can see uh, the screen saying so our part one is ready to make a comeback. So as Helen said, uh, my name's Mike Graney and my role at part one is global head of analysis. So I work on a, a variety of different sources of insight. And today I've been invited to talk about Parkrunners' feelings around the return of Parkrun events. So for those of you watching who are not aware, um, Parkrun events were paused globally in March last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And while we've returned in a number of territories and with junior events in England from the 11th of April, today I'll be focusing on England 5K events uh, using both England and UK data as we continue to work towards the return next month. So we're currently working with around 600 landowners around the return of 5K events in England in June. Today I'll be focusing on partners themselves and talking about two pieces of work that we've done during the pandemic. Firstly, I'll touch on the COVID impact surveys we carried out across uh, key territories in the autumn. Then I'll talk in more detail about our intense return survey that has ran since last July. So I'll just move my screen a tiny bit. Okay, hope you can see that perfectly. Um, so firstly, in the autumn of 2020, we surveyed a representative sample of participants across the UK, Australia and South Africa. So pre-pandemic, that's about 85 to 90 percent of parkrun participation globally. We received responses from nearly 8,000 parkrunners and consistently across the territories, the most commonly felt negative impact on parkrunners was people reporting either a moderate negative or a major negative impact on connections with others in my community. 
So between seven and eight out of 10 park runners across the territories felt this, as you can see in the chart. A little bit higher in Northern Ireland, but really very consistent across the territories. So here's a quote from a, a female park runner who's done over 50 park runs, who's also volunteered on a number of occasions. So it gives me a sense of achievement. It's something I do with family. I've several friends I've made through park run and I haven't seen them since the lockdown began. I felt isolated to a certain extent. I'm 72 years old and it's an outdoor activity I can do with friends. My physical health has deteriorated and my activity level is low. I really miss park run. So that quote was from 30th of September and clearly represents one part runner's feelings at one single point in time. But one ongoing piece of work that we've done that tracks the changes through time is what we call our intent to return survey. Now we started this last July. And so this coming Friday, uh, next Friday coming, it will be our 46th week of running this survey. And so what the survey is, we ask a random sample, sample of walkers, runners and volunteers every Friday morning. And we ask about their experiences, their fears, their attitudes towards the pandemic and their intent to return to park run as a walker, a runner or a volunteer in four weeks time from the point they filled in the survey. We get about a thousand responses per week to the UK survey. So before I take you, I'm going to take you through the whole history of the survey. So all 45 weeks that we've got so far, but there's three key headlines I like to bear in mind. Firstly, part runner intent to return is very resilient. So even at its lowest ebb, the clear majority would return as walkers and runners. Secondly, the feelings of part runners really closely tracks the mainstream media's coverage of the pandemic. So you can pretty confidently predict what next Friday's results will be, having watched the news through the week and seen what the tone of voice is. And thirdly, Recent weeks have been the highest that they've been through the course of this survey. So last Friday was actually the highest that we've seen on record. So the key question that we ask, um, amongst all the other questions, is if official government guidance changed to enable park run to return in four weeks time, how likely would you be to turn up and walk or run? And now I'll take you through how the answers to that question have, have uh, tracked through time. So we ran the first survey, as I mentioned, at the start of July 2020. So in the first week, 68% of people said they would definitely or likely return in four weeks time. And they're in the green on the left hand side of the on the extreme left hand side of this chart. 18% of people said they would maybe come back and they're in the amber. And then at the top, 14% said they'd either be unlikely or very unlikely to return as a walker or runner and they're in red. So we started off at that 68% figure in the green. And then through the summer, as deaths and COVID-19 cases continued to be low, confidence steadily increased up to a high of 80%. Then as cases began to rise at the end of August and into September, and limits on social gatherings of more than six people were banned in England from Monday the 14th of September, you can see the right-hand side bar there, confidence around a return to part run was hit and we actually lost nine percentage points of people in, in, in a week. So we went from 80 to 71% in that one week. However, following this negative hit, people's resilience showed through and their intent to return gradually built back to 76% definitely likely come the 4th of December. Then through December, as the, the COVID situation worsened significantly, followed by a third national lockdown come into, into effect on Tuesday, the 5th of January, we saw the lowest figures that we had on record with just 61% in the definitely likely green group. And the reds, the unlikelies, very unlikelies, almost doubled where they were just a month earlier. And really from then to up until last Friday, it's been a very strong picture. So from the lowest point in January, falling cases, falling hospitalizations and deaths, allied to a strong vac vaccination program, saw confidence build to the current high levels of roughly 81% definitely likely, 10% saying maybe, and 8% saying unlikely or very unlikely. So along with falling hospitalizations and deaths, the vaccination rollout seems to have really benefited confidence in two key ways. So firstly, it gives a general confidence to the nation and to part runners that things are getting better and that there is a future that we can get back towards doing the things that we like to do. 
Secondly, there's a clear benefit to the older groups, those clearly who are more likely to have been vaccinated. So through time, younger park runners have consistently been more likely to want to be ready, to, sorry, more likely to be ready to return. But the gap between the older and the younger participants has closed significantly. So in October, the 65 and overs were 12 points ahead, behind what the average. But now with the oldest having all been offered their first jab and you know, very many having a second jab, the gap was just four points come mid-April. So that's the story in the UK right up to last Friday in terms of walkers and runners. But if I broaden it out a little to volunteers, the picture is also positive here. So volunteer confidence has also built strongly through 2021. And we recently hit an all time, I say all time, clearly we've only been going 45 weeks in this survey, but an all time high. And we're currently at 52% of volunteers in the green, so definitely likely, 32% in the amber maybes, and 16% in the red, unlikely, very unlikelies. And really positively, the main reason that volunteers are less than likely to want to return and volunteer is simply that they'd like to go for a run instead. So those saying that they don't want, they're not ready to volunteer and that COVID-19 fears are the main reason is only around about 10% of the year's worth of volunteers. In a separate piece of research, in March, we went out in England to all event directors, run directors, um, that's over in the year to prior to events being paused, and also to the most frequent volunteers in England. And we asked if they would volunteer when part run returns on 5th of June. We had responses from 15,000 volunteers with every single event being, uh, being covered and represented within those figures. And 77% said they definitely likely return to volunteer, 15% in the maybes and 8% in the red, unlikely, very unlikelies. And for a bit of context, we need, in the average week, we need around about 10% of all the volunteers that have been volunteering over the course of a 12 month period, we need those each week. So if we've got 77% of a year's worth of volunteers saying that they're ready to volunteer, I think it puts us in a very strong position. Broadening out a little bit to beyond the part runners, I mentioned that um, the intense return seems to reflect the temperature in the media and kind of the mood of the nation. It also seems to follow the feelings of the nation in terms of the key well-being measures that you can see on the ONS website. So if you go on the ONS website and you go to the COVID insights section and look at the society section in there, you can see how life satisfaction, happiness and anxiety all took a turn for the worse in January and they've rebounded since, very much like our intense return data. We also know from our data that those who are getting out of the house, those that are getting out and meeting others and being active outside of their house are more likely to be ready to return to park room. And that's certainly what's happening in the nation at large. So uh, the nation are getting out and about more. The majority of people are now meeting others outside of their bubble as we unlock and are, unla and are allowed greater freedoms. So it feels like those who are getting out of the house, shopping and socializing and being active will be more ready to see park room return. And as I mentioned earlier, we're currently working with the landowners around the permissions to get events back in England. And so finally, the final slide is to broaden it out again to the latest global picture. So to keep you up to date um, with what happened last weekend at Park Room, last weekend we saw 67,000 participants and there was 701 events, so just over 700 events globally. And in terms of, I've been talking to the Australia team, and in terms of what they've learned, in terms of volunteering, they found that getting people marshalling out on the course has been a really good way for bringing in people who are nervous about being back together in groups. The same thing for tail walkers as well. And the first time as welcome role, they found that has been a really good uh, way to get new volunteers in. We've also, in a more kind of business as usual survey, we regularly speak to volunteers. And in Australia, we've seen that 99.7% of their volunteers said that they were comfortable participating within the COVID framework. So really, the overwhelming feeling is that people are very happy to be back together again. Now I've been back to junior, we've been back to juniors as a family and I can't wait to get back to my 5K event as soon as possible. So that's it for me from now. Um, I'll, I'll hand you back to Helen. Thanks, Mike. So 45 weeks of um, surveys certainly kept you busy. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm actually going to um, kind of segue straight on to, to Steve and just ask, you know, can you tell us how kind of the, the well-being of park runners during the pandemic compares to before?
Uh, I can't. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. I went to my presentation and my mute button vanished, so I couldn't speak. Sorry, I really <laughs> thought you were just that. you were just keeping us in um, suspense, yeah. there, Steve. So can we just all pretend that didn't happen, and we're going to segue <laughs> straight to this. That was seamless. Thank you. So can you just tell me you can see that, Helen? Yeah, all good, Steve. Great. Okay. So, yeah, so the impact of uh, the pandemic on, on Parkrun. So I, I'm, I'm Steve Hake. I'm chair of the Parkrun uh, Research Board, uh, and we work closely uh, with Mike on research, Helen and I, Alice, uh, and lo lots of others from around the world. So um, the impact of, uh, of the pandemic um, on parkrunners, um, we had a, a survey of 425 uh, parkrunners um, going up to about 450, depending on which question they answered, uh, back in January 2019. And we were able to match those with these surveys that Mike's just described to you that he did over the summer last year. So we, we felt that what we could do is go and back, look at those 420, 450 partners, find out what they'd said before COVID and match it to what they were saying during COVID. And some of the questions were either the same or, or very similar. And really, it just gives us a bit of an idea of pre uh, and, and post. So these are the kind of key questions we wanted to ask was what's the impact of the pandemic on their health and happiness? And, and a secondary question, uh, how will be the impact of Parkrun when it returns? Sorry, that's a terrible sentence. What will be the impact of, of Parkrun uh, when uh, it returns, whenever it does? So um, this is the kind of survey that we've done in the past, the health and wellbeing survey, and again, uh, Alice Bullis, Helen Quirk, Mike are strongly involved in, in creating these surveys, which we, we send out to Parkrunners. And thank you if you've filled out one of these surveys, uh, because it's great. Parkrunners are really enthusiastic. So uh, 450 answered this question. So this is pre-COVID. So this is back about February 2019. Brand new Parkrunners just registered. We asked them this question, how many days of activity did you do in the last week in bouts of 30 minutes or more? And the answer you can give is anything from nothing, zero days of activity, up to seven days of activity. And what you can see is kind of the, the, the average is right here in the middle. So the biggest bar there is, is three. And you get about two thirds of people doing between two and four days a week. But, you know, a big spread from zero up to, to seven. Not many zeros, though. So that was pre-COVID normal service being uh, delivered by, by Parkrun. This is what happened 20 months later. The same people, this is what they're saying now. So I'll just go back so you can see it appear again. There you go. So what you see now is in this middle portion, it's really dropped. Uh, it, this, this one here, the, the threes and the fours have dropped. And actually what you're getting is you're getting about 50% of people in this middle portion now. And then what you see is you see some people here going up. This is the same. And some people here going up. You see more twos, more ones, and a lot more zeros. We've now got 10% of people saying, I'm doing nothing during the week. And that reflects really nationally what happened. Certainly Sport England data looks very similar to this. You get this much more flat profile. You get some people actually increasing activity. Not many, but a small portion going, wow, I've got more time in my day. I'm commuting less. I'm working from home. And I'm able to do more physical activity but you've got quite a lot of people just going, I've lost motivation, I can't do it, whatever. So a lot of people going down. And overall, activity levels on this group have gone down, and that matches what Sport England are saying for, for the English population. So uh, what is the impact of the pandemic on your, right? So this is some of the survey questions that we asked. And the first one was physical health. What's the impact of the pandemic on your physical health. So this was September uh, 2020. So you get about a third say, nah, no impact. You get this proportion, 22% and 5% saying, well, actually my physical health is better. I'm doing a bit more physical activity. 
but you get 38% and 3% saying negative impact. So you've got, you know, four out of 10 people saying, you know, my physical health, it's not as good as it was uh, before the, the pandemic. So the next question we ask is a, a, an ONS, Office of National Statistics question about your happiness. What was your happiness yesterday? That's the question that we ask. Again, you get a few saying, well, you know what, oh, I'm a bit happier. 20%, 21%, so one in five saying, nah, no impact. But actually look at this, 62% saying I'm, I'm less happy, 7% uh, saying it's, it's actually affecting me badly. So that's 69%, almost seven out of 10 saying I'm, I'm less happy during the pandemic. Bear in mind, these are park runners. These were new park runners and park runners are quite keen uh, people in doing physical activity and a fairly healthy bunch. Um, this is the question on life satisfaction. What's the impact of the pandemic on your life satisfaction? And actually this is uh, life satisfaction in general is how that question goes. So it's more about, you know, your, your general feeling about life, the universe and everything. So again, one in five, no impact, small proportion saying better, but again, 61% saying my life satisfaction is worse, 6% much worse. So, you know, you've got 67%. And then we've got connections with others. Mike mentioned this before that he'd see he'd been asking this question right the way through the pandemic. And if you remember, he actually said in England it was about 70%. In our little cohort, connection with others, 53% said it was worse. 20% said that it had a major negative impact on their connection with others. So these are park runners saying it's really affecting how I meet people. And then lastly, I suppose the catch all for all of this what's the impact of the pandemic on our mental health again you've got just over a third saying no impact a few saying my mental health is better but again 52% plus 7 59% uh, saying that their mental health is worse or much worse if we just compare that back to physical health as bookends so physical health has gone down but mental health has, uh, uh, has gone down um, uh, much more uh, than physical health. So that's what park runners are saying to us. And, and I have to say, you know, in all our surveys, park runners are quite a keen, physically active, relatively healthy bunch, not exclusively. And so if it's happening to park runners, you know, it's happening in, a, in a, probably a worse way to the, to the rest of the nation. So what can we do about it? What's the likely impact of Park One when it returns? Well, of course, we won't find out until that happens, but what we can do is we can go back to our new Park Runners and ask them um, from previous surveys, what did they say following registration with Park Run? And again, we've got the same survey, but actually this time, this is going back to a much larger survey we did with 60,000 survey returns. So we're, the, these results are pretty nailed on in terms of numbers and efficacy and, and power. So here's the question that we usually that we've asked. Thinking about the impact of park run on your health and well-being, to what extent has running or walking at park run changed? And again we've got all these questions and we go from much worse, worse, no impact, better, much better. So very similar to the COVID question. Um, but now, what's the impact of parkrun, running at parkrun on, on your health and well-being? So now, most people answer either no impact, better or much better for this. So I'm going to ignore the worst, much worse. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to report the proportions that say better or much better for, for these different questions. So let's go straight in. What's the impact? So this is in order of largest to smallest for most of those questions. And so in terms of our 60,000, our sense of personal achievement came out top. So nine out of 10 people said, I had this sense of personal achievement. Um, nine out of 10 said my fitness was better. Something like 83% said that their physical health was better. So remembering that physical health had got worse during the pandemic for our small cohort of park runners. It's looking good that people who then take up park run will, you know, return to the physical health that they might that they had before. So that that that's that that's quite positive. Eight out of ten said that happiness had improved. 
We've got things like amount of time you spent outdoors, more than seven out of 10, more than 70%. Feeling part of a community. And this is getting back to this connections question. We've got seven out of 10 park runners saying, I feel part of a community. And we feel that this is probably the, the key part, the key thing that our park runners have lost during the pandemic. There's mental health, very similar. Seven out of 10 saying that their mental health has been improved because of running or walking at Parkrun. And we've got a few other things here that we, we could talk about at some other point. So that's just what's the impact of running or walking. Now, Mike also talked about volunteering. And if we look here, this is the same question, but what's the impact of volunteering at Parkrun on your, and here's the same, uh, the same questions. So some of these are lower, only 20% say the fitness has improved through volunteering. But actually, you know, given that they're not taking part in the cardiovascular part of Parkrun, they're doing the volunteering part. I think, you know, 20% saying their fitness is approved is quite, you know, pr pretty good, as with physical health. But there are some things that are, are almost, you know, almost as good. Happiness, if you volunteer, it improves your happiness in a similar fashion, a uh, sense of personal achievement. But look at this, feeling part of a community more than 80% of those who volunteered said they feel part of a community and the number of new people you meet. And that probably reflects what Mike was saying about what the volunteers are saying about getting people back to park and volunteering is a very good way to do that if you're a little bit nervous about doing the run itself. So I think that bodes well for a return to park run and this idea that, you know, coming back to Parkrun might mitigate for some of those, the downsides that the pandemic has had on people's physical uh, and mental health uh, over the period. So here's just a few things that people have said in our surveys. Uh, it's the first time I felt part of a community around where I live. I love it. And, and we get that a lot. Uh, my depression medication is down to an eighth of what I started on. And that person was saying, I still have lows. Uh, but, you know, Parkrun's really helped me with my life. Parkrun gives me an endorphin boost, which phase four cardiac rehab does not. Uh, it does beg the question, what is phase four cardiac rehab? So I want to kind of look that up. I don't know what it is. And I know we've got some medics online, so maybe they can tell me. Um, having survived a mental breakdown, Parkrun's helped me to love myself. Again, we get some fantastic comments, people saying, I don't necessarily like the person that goes to Parkrun, but I like the person that leaves it. Uh, and then lastly, I don't know if GPs prescribe Parkruns, but they should. And of course, Parkrun is prescribed. We have a GP uh, Parkrun prescribing platform. So I'll finish there. Just a reminder, we do have junior Parkrun and there's our local junior Parkrun on the Olympic Lakes Park in Sheffield. Uh, thank you, I'll stop there. Thanks, Steve. So, um, yeah, it, it does it does bode well in terms of the potential health and well-being impacts uh, that we can see. Um, and just to kind of smoothly go into a, a, a conversation with Rebecca, I just wonder then, you know, if if it is all looking good in terms of um, the potential for improvements, health and well-being. How how can we make um, you know a safe and sensible return to Parkrun as individuals? So, so Rebecca, um, thanks for joining us today. Um, would you just like to tell us quickly about your role as a sport and exercise medic, what that means, and what's been keeping you busy during the pandemic? Thanks, Helen. It's really good um, to be here. So I am a consultant in sports and exercise medicine. And I guess from the title, you can kind of see the, the balance already between the medical side that was needed in and through COVID, and then also part of my role and our role as sports exercise medicine doctors is from beginners to elite looking after people's health in terms of their ability to be physically active because we know it's so good um, for health so um yeah from february 2020 it's been really busy um, initially the elite sports that i work with that's one part of my job is getting people ready to go to tokyo and that was meant to happen last year but that's meant to happen this year now so at the time of lockdown elite sports also locked down but from quite an early point in that process elite sport had a special dispensation if someone was on that trajectory to go to an olympics to under very controlled conditions to go back into training so we kind of spent the best part of march april may risk ratifying everything every conceivable um, way that you can imagine that for those sports environments now that was a small number of people it could be very regulated it was very 
limited in terms of numbers. The doctor, as they meet for a couple of sports, was on call all of that time. Um, so that's been tremendously busy and remains so because now we're getting to the point where people are qualifying for the Olympics, that we as a country sort of, we need sports, you know, to, to sort of enjoy that and inspire us. So we're trying to work with that side of things too. In my other side of my life, um, in terms of the, the sports and exercise medicine, um, it's been really interesting. I started doing a bit of a brief advice clinic for people coming back after COVID. And initially, just before this time last year, the terms around long COVID didn't exist. So um, basically I was working with a clinic in London called CHHP and we were trying to give really that advice that had been given to athletes who are in elite system about coming back after a viral illness like COVID um, to tailor that back so it's a kind of safe return back in for you to sport. But what kind of transpired then um, was finding that long COVID was, a, was an entity, something we don't fully understand and something for active people that can be tremendously hard to navigate. So kind of had some um, had some interesting times then. It's been great helping guide people through getting better. And what's also been brilliant is doing a project with AWRC as well, in terms of reaching out into the community for um, long COVID. So that, as well as all the normal day-to-day -day sports exercise medicine. So it's been a busy time, I guess. Yeah, and I mean, I think you are probably one of the busiest people. I know, you know, you're on podcasts, you've been in Women's Health magazine. You know, you, you really are passionate, aren't you, about sharing these kind of uh, messages. Um, and so just can you just tell us how does the advice you give to athletes kind of translate to us normal folk? Well, I think um, I would totally I would say that, that everyone's an athlete. You need to totally prove differently. So I've got athletes that are like young teenagers coming into sports. We've got those kind of peaking towards their Olympic ambition. I've got athletes who are in their 80s swimming and cycling. Um, and also people coming back from illness, too. So everybody is an athlete and the same rules can apply. Obviously, in the funded system, we have this wonderful um, support network around every athlete. So we have the medicine, nutrition, psychology, physiology, um, physiotherapy. But actually, some of that advice is really healthy living advice. So it's just trying to help support people wherever they are, whatever their ambitions are in terms of sport and exercise. And the reason um, for that is because we know it's so important um, for health. Um, there have been some there have been some really good um pieces of research even out this year saying how important physical activity is so it's that balance which I hugely appreciate the work that Parkrun are doing to come back because we know that ultimately it gives so much to our health to be active so really the job of a sports exercise medicine doctor one could argue is more well more needed perhaps even in that sphere where people are less active like in um, in Steve's um, graphs you can see that the drop-off we need to find out why and we need to help people back for their health. Yeah yeah absolutely and so if anyone's kind of listening in today and perhaps their activity level has dropped during um this period or you know they've they've had covid they've they've they're, they're in the recovery from that but is thinking about you know potentially making the park run comeback um what what advice would you would you give um, it's always easy as well to give advice like we're all i think we're all fully part runners here how we go into it but I think the main thing is to kind of like remember what you've been missing about it so it's kind of if you've got a time on your pb that you've done a part run sort of forget about that and just think about all the reasons to get back into it and if someone's healthy but has done less activity maybe even starting now just to get back into that routine and actually using that goal you know i think not putting too much pressure onto the date that part one comes back but hopefully that being hopefully soon we can build up and all the good routines so if someone's actually fallen off their routine something like couch to 5k is a brilliant resource to guide people back in it's also a good time now that you can see physios and sports therapists to check in if there's a niggle that you can't quite work out because those are the things that derail us and especially when we feel like we're running well um i think you know sometimes starting now we can exercising with others a little bit can help motivate you but it can help motivate somebody else as well so don't be worried about being further back because if you're further back in the pack or even like close to the tail walkers what if you're helping somebody else get through so that'd be my main advice and just to pick up on in terms of covid long covid is a really really harsh um, thing to deal with many people get covid and thankfully you make a really good recovery and can go steadily back into exercise really should take it steady for a good couple of weeks and then just come back in slowly but if they've been dealing with long covid there are hubs, there are resources in terms of um, where to seek medical help. 
Um, some of us in sports excess medicine and rehab medicine are really kind of focusing around that. Um, for example, there is definitely a time that you need to um, press the pause button really, um, that some people can't be active, but we need to put the resources in on a personal level, but support people because ultimately that physical activity is what's healthy physically and mentally. So even if it's a long road, getting back is, is what I'd say is important. Great. Oh, thanks, Rebecca. And I don't know, I'm personally thankful I'll be putting my PB to one side for a little while because um, I think I'm a bit I'm a bit, a bit off that right now. Um, so thanks so much, Rebecca. If anyone has any other questions related to this for Rebecca, please put them in the chat and we'll definitely pick those, those up. I'm sure there are some burning questions. Um, I'm just going to pick up on some of the questions we've had in the chat. Um, I think there's one here for Mike from, from Shona. Um, is there any granularity available showing the difference of opinion between casual slash new park runners and regular experienced park runners? Yeah, sure. That's a really good question. And that's something that we've looked at kind of behind the numbers that I presented earlier. And yeah, there is a, a fair difference. So those that are more embedded in part run, who have volunteered the most times, who have run the most times, they are more confident and ready to return than those who are doing fewer walks and runs and volunteer stints. And that's kind of that's one of the ways that we've that we've looked at it and kind of split people up. But to give a bit more detail around um, different uh, different sets of groups, um, really one of the big things that is defining people or that is helping uh, drive people's readiness to come back to part run is kind of their overall feeling around the pandemic and their sort of overall confidence. So people who are getting out and about. Um, playing sport, meeting friends, they are the most likely group to be feeling that they're ready to come back to part run. Um, but generally, another thing that's happened is that as the confidence increases and decreases, most, most of the different groups kind of broadly move together. You know, I mentioned that the older groups, that they've kind of, they've shrunk their, the gap in terms of their, their lack of confidence compared to, to other groups, but most groups kind of move together. <laughs> Another thing that we've seen is that so yeah, younger people have been more likely to want to come back. In terms of the different uh, home nations in the UK, have also split that out. Generally, Northern Ireland has been ahead through really through the second wave, so kind of since November time. And actually now Wales is kind of moving a little ahead of England uh, as well. Particularly, you know, they've got a very you know, my understanding is a strong vaccination program and a, uh, a very low prevalence of COVID at the moment. Um, there's also a bit of a, a gender gap that exists, so females slightly less likely uh, to want to come back. And to be honest, we've got about seven minutes left, and that's a whole kind of session on its own around um, female participation. But a lot of that, I think, is kind of bound up in you know, not, you know, there are some COVID impacts there. I think a lot of that is around females or part, run, part running females up generally less likely to be turning out on a, on a given Saturday. So we have a 44% of walks and runs uh, come from females on an, in an average week, whereas in an average year, it's around, you know, it's much, much closer to 50-50. And I think that's, you know, a lot of that is around sort of systemic issues around why females aren't participating. The types of things that we've been trying to tackle, you know, for, for years and years at Part Run through our comms and kind of inclusivity and that kind of agenda. Um, I also think there is a bit of a pandemic uh, issue around females as well. It seems that um, more females have dropped out of activity entirely through the pandemic. And also I think there's a, a, um, I think a, a factor within that is also around, you know, the amount of um, domestic work being taken on by females. That seems to have been something that's, that has further increased through the pandemic. But yeah, as I say, that's kind of getting into a, quite a, a larger question. But yeah, hopefully that answers the question. In, the direct answer to the question is yes, those that are more embedded in part run and have done more part runs, they are more confident around the return. Brilliant. Thanks, Mike. Um, and there was a question either for Mike or Steve around. So we've got we've got an issue in research generally and probably in the data insights that you do, Mike, that it sometimes only reaches people that are keen to answer surveys. What are, what are, what can we learn or are we are we gaining any insights from those that are less likely to fill in surveys? So it was a question from Josh asking about social listening in addition to surveys. Um, those who are less engaged or unlikely to do surveys. Have we got any of that kind of insight? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, that is a very, it's a really good question. And it's a definitely a challenging thing for us. You know, clearly we, you know, I've mentioned a lot of surveys that we work on, but clearly that doesn't reach everybody. We don't have any kind of structured kind of sentiment analysis and, you know, and picking up on social things in, in a sort of um, systematic and structured way. But I definitely know that our exceptionally talented and busy comms team are certainly always looking at, 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 uh, at the responses that we're getting back from our social posts and that kind of thing. So, yeah, there's nothing that we we do on a systematic basis but yeah we're you know we're all part runners on the staff team and, and and amongst the ambassadors so we're definitely listening as you know as much as we possibly can great and steve um i'm too old to really know what social listening means uh <laughs> but in in terms of our survey um we've got park runners are so interested in parkrun that you know getting 60,000 survey returns is fantastic and it means that you can delve down into little subgroups so you can easily get you can get down to a thousand people uh, that may be from a particular area an area of deprivation inactive and so we can delve down to that kind of granularity and get some you know statistically significant findings and certainly one of the things we find is that for, for people um, who were previously inactive when they've taken up parkrun um, if they engage in parkrun and, and become a parkrunner then um, they become uh, kind of really one of the most loyal parkruns. They tend to do more parkruns per year than the average parkrun, whatever the average parkrunner is. Similarly with people from deprived communities, if they get engaged with parkrun, they become very loyal to parkrun and perhaps do more than, than most. And one of the reasons for that is you tend to get, you know, uh, lots of women uh, doing parkrun from those particular groups. And parkrun becomes a safe environment uh, to run in and, and safe both in terms of being non-judgmental but also physically safe running in groups and so on so so yes we can do all sorts of things there um, but it is a it is a factor you know we get return server returns from people who like to fill out surveys yeah um yeah and that's a challenge in research generally isn't it that we need to really tackle um one last question um there was a couple of questions in the chat i think more around kind of ongoing monitoring and assessment um and then i also have a question around how will we know if parkrun is bringing the health and happiness of people back up again Has, are there plans for this kind of ongoing monitoring of the situation I'm going to let well in terms of insights we, we don't have plans to do any you know imminent research uh, projects or, on that uh, front at the moment but we're we kind of in the background we're always looking at ways of doing that uh, Mike I don't know about insights you know so inside parkrun I'll, I'll pass that on to him yeah um, there's nothing specifically planned in terms of, I mean, clearly a, a huge amount of, our, of our, our focus and our headspace at the moment is around getting part run back and getting the return, um, getting the return successfully and kind of uh, pulled through. But yeah, I mean, that is certainly something that we'll be looking at. I think a very simple way that we can track things just on a weekly basis is so as many of you know at the point that you register with parkrun we can see uh, people's um, activity levels in the last 30 days at the point that they signed up with parkrun so very very quickly we can see whether those are new participants at parkrun we can see how active they were in, in the in the past few months and there's certainly been a very steady supply of new parkrunners um, in other territories where they've returned actually in Australia at first in the kind of first few weeks uh, kind of pre-Christmas um, to the Australian return it was uh, ever so slightly more um, dominated by people who have done loads and loads of part runs but very soon afterwards there's a very clear supply of new part runners and certainly looking into that and seeing whether they are people who are kind of getting off the couch if you like is certainly something that we can monitor but there's no specific plan for any kind of um post-COVID return research right now. We're just very, very focused on making sure we get back and that we've got something to, uh, to look at as soon as we possibly can. Yeah, sorry sorry about that, Mike. I made out like, um, yeah, you know, I've got enough on your plate. Um, so yeah, in the interest of time, I'm probably gonna start to wrap up there. Thanks so much for our speakers today, to Mike, Steve and Rebecca, for sharing your insights and your knowledge. Thanks to everyone um, for joining us. 
and, and engaging in the discussion. I've really enjoyed um, reading through the, the chats. Um, really nice to hear um, some people doing Couch to 5K and really like in the preparation for, for Parkrun coming back and being really sensible in that respect. So that's, that's brilliant. Um, the recording will be available um, afterwards to, to, to listen to again or to share with friends, family, colleagues, anyone that might want to listen. So that the link's there in the chat. The flyer you can see on the screen is for our next um, seminar in July, um, where we're going to be in conversation with um, Professor Andy Shannon and Dr. Emma McKinney about park running during pregnancy, which I think will be really, really interesting. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for the registration details um, for that. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for this. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. And yeah, take care, everyone. Um, oh, great. We've even had people from um, South Africa listening in. So yeah, brilliant. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye, everybody. <laughs>